Всеки има ли, всеки, който има нужда от машинка за превод, има ли? And I'll repeat this in English. Does everybody who needs translation device have it? Окей. Okay. Предполагаме, че има. А, ваши превъзходителства, а, много ми е, изключително ми е драго, че по време на българското председателство на а, Европейския съюз, в штаб квартирата на това председателство, в Националния дворец на културата, със специална благодарност към неговото ръководство, имаме възможност да се срещнем с а, един а, забележителен американски дипломат, който познава Европа, познава региона, но аз няма да представям посланник Фил Рикер в момента, тъй като тази, с тази благородна мисия се нагърви посланник Поп Тодорова, българския посланник в Съединените щати до неотдавна. Но преди да й дам думата на нея, искам специално да поздравя нашите, нашите много специални гости. Ние често сме били заедно в този формат и с посланника на Съединените щати Ерик Рубин и с посланника на Пакистан, с посланника на Дания. Но сега за първ път мисля, че сме заедно с заместник посланничката на Швейцария в София и за първ път сме заедно с новата посланничка на Холандия в Недерландс. България. Затова много специално искам да ги приветствам за тяхното първо посещение на сбирка на Атлантическия клуб. И имаме, ако пропускам някое посолство, убедете се да не бида, защото малко, може би, съм късоглед. И имаме специални гости от град Пазарджик. Това е гимназия Аксаков от която тук имаме а, младшите, младшите европейски посланници и един от старшите, един и двама, които се водят от а, тяхната директорка и тяхната учителка в а, Пазаджик. И затова ще ги помоля всичките да станат, за да ги видите. Ето. Това е едно от само 30-те сенете. Uh, само 30-те uh, български училища, които участват в тази програма на Европейския съюз. И съм сигурен, че uh, много от посолствата и дипломатите, uh, и генералите, и офицерите, специално искам да поздравя и военното отношение на Съединените щати в България. Uh, много от вас ще проявят интерес да, оздравят, да посетят uh, нашите млади приятели в uh, Пазаржик, защото бъдещето на Европейския съюз очевидно е в uh, техните ръце. С тези няколко думи искам да поканя посланник Поп Тодорова да представи нашия уважаван гост. Заповядайте, госпожо посланник. A more gratifying occasion of introducing a colleague, a friend, a comrade in arms, I would say, what uh, Phil, Ambassador Philip Rieker, Phil, is to uh, not just me, but to many Bulgarians. Um, actually, I look forward to a most interesting lecture from him, or talk from him, because he's taking a key position now um, uh, at the UCOM, and this is the civilian deputy uh, to UCOM, uh, which has everything to do with uh, the work of, of both the Atlantic Club and uh, all member states of NATO. Um, and this is uh, the We Are NATO campaign and rendering the importance, the, the role, the mission of, your, of the alliance um, uh, to a broader audience. Um, actually, I think uh, Ambassador Rieker is probably the best suited for this audience, the Bulgarian audience, because he seems to have actually always been in positions that have everything to do with Bulgaria's both foreign and security policy. He did serve in Iraq as uh, the public uh, diplomacy uh, 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 officer, because he is a career foreign service officer. He was um, uh, actually the spokesperson for the Kosovo talks, uh, working closely with Ambassador Chris Hill. He served as ambassador to Macedonia, as well as as deputy chief of mission in many um, central European embassies uh, uh, in, in Europe. 
Uh, actually, if I am to use the shortest description of who Ambassador Phil Rieker is, I would use one of his titles, and it is uh, Spokesman at Large. Phil, I wish I had invented the title. It, it is the perfect title for someone who has done public diplomacy all his life and which is so close to my heart as well, but no, uh, it was the State Department who obviously uh, holds in high uh, the importance uh, uh, the ability and the, the importance of talking to audiences. So um, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to the spokesman at large who has now expanded the territory beyond the US and is practically covering the whole uh, NATO area. Here you are. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Elena, Ambassador Paptodorova. Um, it's really such a, a privilege for me to be here, and thank you, Dr. Passi Solomon, for, uh, for inviting me to the Atlantic Club. Uh, there was a time, about a year, when I formally was the spokesman at large, and now, uh, particularly after spending three years in Italy, following so much time in the Balkans, I feel sometimes like the large spokesman. Uh, but. Coming back to Bulgaria is a great treat, and congratulations uh, to Bulgaria, to all Bulgarians, on uh, an extraordinary uh, period as president of the European Union. Uh, it's, I think, particularly appropriate uh, that we're able to celebrate um, not just the EU, but the transatlantic alliance during these particular months. And we in the United States are incredibly fortunate to have here representing us my dear friend, uh, Ambassador Eric Rubin. Uh, he and his team in our wonderful embassy uh, are dedicated to promoting the US-Bulgaria tie, which is historic, which is strong, uh, and, uh, and has a tremendous future ahead. Uh, for me, coming back uh, and finding Elena here, uh, it makes me nostalgic because, of course, she was Bulgaria's extraordinary ambassador to the United States uh, for many years, but when I was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, uh, along with Ambassador Rubin, uh, and I was covering the portfolio of Central Europe uh, and the Balkans. And, of course, Bulgaria is such a key part of that. And so it's, it's great to be back in Bulgaria. Uh, I've spent a majority of my career uh, in this region, and uh, with whatever titles uh, I may have and may get used, I think the, the one I like most is transatlanticist. I consider myself very much uh, dedicated to the transatlantic ideal, and uh, this is a particularly important time uh, because 75 years ago, this year, the United States, our military, uh, came back to Europe a country that has such roots and origins in Europe, both in terms of our people, but also in terms of our philosophy, uh, our view uh, of the liberal order, of the rule of law, the values that we share with Europe, uh, and of course, the challenges that we face together. And 75 years ago, uh, American soldiers and, and airmen and uh, sailors, including a, a naval officer uh, who was my grandfather, uh, landed in Sicily and uh, began the, uh, the Italian campaign to liberate uh, the continent from uh, the fascist threat uh, and Nazism. And we've been through a lot together since that time. And uh, for me, it's uh, a great honor to have taken up just a few months ago uh, the role of uh, civilian deputy to the commander of United States forces in Europe. General Curtis Mike Scaparotti uh, has two hats. He is, of course, the Supreme Allied Commander Europe for NATO, but he is, uh, and he would tell you, first and foremost, as a, as a uh, four-star career army general, the commander of UCOM, European Command, based in Stuttgart. And he has two deputies. One is a, a three-star uh, deputy military commander, and the other is a civilian, a civilian career diplomat. 
And uh, many people find this very interesting that in our military command, we would have a civilian uh, at a high position in the headquarters. And I found it particularly interesting because after a 25-year career in the State Department, a variety of uh, diplomatic uh, foreign service capacities, to join a military command uh, has really brought so much of it together and made me realize how much our military efforts, security and defense, are intertwined with our diplomatic efforts. And from diplomacy, that in includes our official diplomacy, but also our, our public diplomacy. As uh, Ambassador Paptodorova mentioned, public diplomacy and engagement across cultures, uh, across nations, is so crucial, particularly in this day and age, this part of the 21st century, uh, when we're so bombarded with uh, information, with misinformation, we need to go back and, and remember to talk to each other. So I'm very gratified to see young ambassadors, youth ambassadors, the future of diplomacy uh, joining us here today. I congratulate you all uh, on this program uh, and I wish you luck as you uh, continue with this and I hope to see you someday representing your country, Bulgaria, perhaps in the United States um, or as part of the the Great Transatlantic Alliance. I'll just speak for a few more minutes and then uh, join Dr. Passi and we can have a bit of a discussion because I think uh, rather than have you listen to me talk, I'd like to hear from you your questions, your comments, and uh, have this kind of uh, dialogue that I know our embassy here in, in Sofia promotes. But a few words on, on my role as a civilian deputy commander and and foreign policy advisor to uh, General Scaparotti. Essentially, I'm the primary link between United States European Command uh, and the Department of State. And of course, you may all know that we have a new Secretary of State leading the department, Secretary Pompeo, uh, who took office just last week. Uh, and I think it's worth pointing out in this context when we're talking about transatlantic relations that 12 hours after taking the oath of office as the Secretary of State, the 70th Secretary of State in the history of the United States of America, Secretary Pompeo was seated at the North Atlantic Council in Brussels uh, with his colleagues from the 28 other uh, NATO allied states. And that was a statement on his part. He went directly from being uh, confirmed and sworn in as secretary, getting on a plane, flying across the Atlantic, uh, arriving at 3 a.m. in Brussels to be that morning at the North Atlantic Council uh, with all of his new colleagues, uh, the foreign ministers from, from all 29 allies, uh, and had, I think, a very productive set of, of meetings there. I was just uh, earlier in the week uh, in a conversation with our Assistant Secretary of State for Europe, Wes Mitchell, who uh, was with uh, Secretary Pompeo in Brussels, and he attested to the fact that uh, there's a new energy uh, in our high-level diplomacy, uh, and I think we're all very engaged in uh, working uh, on all of the things NATO is involved with, all of the transatlantic uh, aspects as we work up to the NATO summit in, in July. Now, I've been at UCOM uh, just about six months now, and uh, it's interesting that I come here and I wear headphones to get translation uh, from Bulgarian, uh, a language that I, I do understand a bit of from many years in the region and my time as ambassador uh, next door, uh, where they speak a, a similar language. And, uh, uh, but you know, after a few years away, I need uh, the headphones and translation, and I realized that I could actually use that almost every day in my job at NATO, because the military speaks a language that sometimes leaves me completely lost. Um, and after 25 years of, of uh, professional experience, sometimes I say, wow, I, I really have to go back to school and I have a lot to learn. Uh, but I'm blessed because uh, the command, European command, is so embracing of the role uh, of civilian deputy that uh, they and, and my team, my colleagues uh, who traveled with me, uh, 
help us to translate for each other. The, the military speak, the jargon, the acronyms, uh, and the diplomatic speak, which I think for many in the military may be just as foreign sometimes, and our attaches who join our embassies can attest to that, wondering, I'm sure, uh, what, are, what are they talking about? But that's what's so important, is that we, we talk to each other, among each other, within our own countries, within our own uh, institutions, but then, of course, across borders and across the Atlantic uh, to promote the transatlantic uh, agenda. So I've been struck by the appetite at the command for the views from the State Department, the views of diplomats. General Scaparotti, uh, on a daily basis, will ask me, what does the ambassador think? What does the country team, what is our embassy saying about a situation any place? Before he came to Bulgaria recently in his capacity as the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, he asked me to be in touch with our embassy, he talked to Ambassador Rubin, to get a good picture of the perspective from a diplomat's vantage point. Uh, and he is always combining the diplomatic with the military. General Scavarotti is, is a remarkable uh, man, a remarkable leader, uh, who is a soldier. He's a, a U.S. Army soldier, a graduate of West Point. Uh, he's a commander, uh, a tremendous leader, uh, but he's also a diplomat at heart, and I, I can see that. Um, he is very careful to make sure that the equities of diplomacy are always calculated in uh, to what we do uh, militarily and as an alliance. And uh, as he told the Congress recently, in his regular testimony to Congress, that in augmenting our defense, U.S. defense, the United States is joined by the NATO alliance, which remains so critical to our national security and to the rules-based international order. As General Scaparotti said, every challenge we face as a nation and have faced for the past 75 years is best addressed with our allies. And so I can tell you from experience that that is not just idle talk. It's very much a part of what drives United States European Command as uh, we implement our uh, national security uh, plans, our national defense strategy, working very closely with our allies. One of the uh, main priorities under General Scaparotti is our strategic partnerships. And obviously NATO represents uh, the most successful alliance, I think, in history, uh, an institution, a set of relationships, uh, a structure which has helped to maintain the peace and stability on this continent for 75 years and allowed us to have a level of prosperity that's unprecedented uh, in European history. For all the challenges we face every day, economically, uh, culturally, uh, moving forward in a complicated world, we need to remember how far we've come and what we've accomplished, and we've done that uh, together. Now, the European theater, as we refer to it from UCOM, uh, is vast and diverse, uh, but the Black Sea region, I think, is one of the most strategically important regions in Europe, and it is uh, a part of the theater that has a persistent attention from UCOM. And the efforts and contributions of, of strategic partners in the region of allies like Bulgaria are recognized very much at the highest levels. As I said, General Scaparotti was here very recently and he highlighted Bulgaria's key role in promoting stability and peace in the region, pointing out the contributions Bulgaria makes to K4 in Kosovo, uh, a project that is very close uh, to my heart because of my professional involvement with it over time and the progress that has been made there and the challenges that remain, what we have to do together. But Bulgaria contributes to that because it's in Bulgaria's interest to have a region uh, that is stable and can be prosperous. Uh, NATO patrols in the Black Sea are an important contribution by Bulgaria, as well as the continued dedication of Bulgaria to NATO's resolute support mission in Afghanistan. We see that the threats and challenges to our security can come from far beyond the borders uh, of NATO and its member countries. 
and Afghanistan is a fine example of that. My colleagues at NATO, of course, are very quick to point out that Bulgaria is very much on the right track with regard to the pledge made at uh, the Wales summit uh, to dedicate 2% of gross domestic product uh, toward uh, defense. And uh, Bulgaria has a credible plan to reach that 2% goal by 2024. Uh, and that's something um, for which we give, uh, give great credit. It's important to remember that investing in defense, investing in security, is an investment in the future of the country. It has many different aspects, uh, not only being able to defend yourself from potential threats and the unexpected, but uh, as we've discovered in the United States over decades, investment in defense has been a great road towards, uh, towards innovation, towards technological development, uh, towards economic growth, uh, and so I think there's a, an aspect that needs to be looked at, at that. I just mentioned finally too that um, from a bilateral U.S.-Bulgaria standpoint, uh, UConn were very much aware uh, of Bulgaria's demonstrated capability during uh, the exercise last year called Sabre Guardian, and we'll have an, an opportunity to, to do that again, to exercise together with Bulgaria during the Sabre Guardian 2019 exercise. So all this is to say that at UCOM there really is a, general, a genuine recognition and appreciation for the skills and the capabilities that our European allies bring to the table. There's a recognition that national contributions through NATO and other platforms can be relied upon to provide security in the European theater. Uh, some people have suggested that uh, this is a pretext for the United States pulling back, withdrawing support from uh, European security. And I'm here to say that that is absolutely not the case. Secretary Pompeo demonstrated that by making his first priority to go to the North Atlantic Council to sit as an equal member with the other 28 foreign ministers representing there. But I also want to point out uh, that the 60,000 US military personnel who were in theater, the 4.8 billion dollars that we provided for the European Deterrence Initiative in 2018 are themselves additional uh, examples of how we demonstrate our dedication to the transatlantic ideal and to European security. With Bulgaria specifically, the U.S. is committed to supporting the modernization of Bulgaria's armed forces and to enhancing interoperability and compatibility with NATO. So it should be abundantly clear to all that the United States remains committed to Europe and European security. And as we support strategic allies and partners, uh, I think there's a window of opportunity for European countries to develop their own national defense capabilities and increase their influence over the security environment in Europe. Emerging initiatives with the European Union on defense widen the window of opportunity. And we say that because we see these EU initiatives and, and uh, other coalitions of the willing uh, as something that expands and complements our existing uh, NATO alliance and structures. If you uh, avoid duplication of effort, you simply multiply uh, the force structures and the efforts uh, at, at security. Now, many of these initiatives are very much in their nascent stages, but we spend a lot of time at UCOM working closely with colleagues in the European Union and in Brussels and with individual member states and allies uh, in discussing how we can move forward with these initiatives uh, to be compatible, interoperable, not duplicative, and to strengthen NATO at the same time. So I think there's widespread understanding that collective defense uh, is a NATO mission alone, but that the emerging security issues in the theater need to be addressed jointly by NATO and the EU. And those threats include uh, the challenges of cyber warfare, hybrid threats, terrorism, which we're all aware of, and military mobility, just how to move, how to ensure and preserve and maintain infrastructure that allows military mobility but can also be used and, and beneficial to uh, civilian uh, and uh, commercial use. So uh, 
let me finish these remarks by just uh, acknowledging what uh, Ambassador Poptodorova said about public diplomacy. That is something that I take uh, very close to my heart. Uh, it's been a big part of, of my career. Uh, and I always remember uh, one of the diplomats uh, who I worked for early in my career, Richard Holbrook, who said that any ambassador should spend his or her time, 80% uh, of his or her time, on public diplomacy, on reaching out, on uh, uh, embracing different audiences, not just other ambassadors, but students, civilians, uh, not just in the capital, but all around uh, the country. And so we take that seriously at UCOM as well, and that's why General Scaparotti has asked me uh, to travel, uh, to visit uh, countries in our theater, uh, to visit our partners, and to have this kind of engagement with important uh, organizations like uh, you know, the Atlantic uh, club which study and promote the kinds of values that we share and the importance of this relationship. So let me stop there with uh, some ideas and hopefully we can uh, move on to some other discussion and your questions. But again, I'm delighted to be here and I thank you for hosting me and thank you for all you're doing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. The first time when I had the uh, privilege to visit uh, SHAPE and to meet uh, the pre predecessor of uh, General Scaparotti was 1990, and, uh, uh, no November 1990, and this was the place and the moment when we announced that we are planning to uh, establish the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. It was General John Galvin, if I'm not mistaken, right, right, right. who was uh, commander at that time. And I thought I knew something about shape, but uh, after listening uh, uh, to you, I understood that I do not know so much uh, about it, and especially about uh, your job. It was uh, extremely uh, illuminating to, uh, to listen to you. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, also live TV coverage, and uh, we shall have uh, this uh, uh, talk on uh, our uh, YouTube and uh, all the channels uh, which we have today. And uh, I would like to specially thank uh, uh, General Dynamics uh, European Land Systems, Contracts and Atlantic Technology for their support, the Diplomatic Institute, and of course, the US Embassy in Bulgaria and uh, the team of uh, Ambassador Rubin uh, for their great uh, support and uh, the excellent job that they did uh, uh, on this uh, occasion. Uh, you mentioned also uh, uh, Macedonia. And uh, uh, there is a very uh, inter good news for me, uh, which uh, I would like to publicize more. We have representatives of Macedonia here in this, uh, uh, in, in this hall. Uh, but uh, what we heard recently is that the day after tomorrow, for the day of the Bulgarian Armed Forces, we shall have a Macedonian unit marching together with uh, the Bulgarian uh, Armed Forces uh, uh, for the parade. This is really an excellent news. And uh, also I wanted to announce that we have not only representatives of Pazergi here, but we have also represent and, and Macedonia and the country's ambassadors and diplomats that I mentioned, but we have also representatives of Veliko Ternovo. Uh, the city council of Veliko Ternovo is uh, here with us. So most welcome to uh, the ancient capital of Bulgaria, uh, to the Atlantic Club. We, uh, in, uh, we can give an uh, informal uh, start of the campaign hashtag we are NATO with uh, your visit here and we hope to have more and more visitors from uh, NATO uh, and uh, from the United States, from the UK and all allies to, to, to speak to us on, on this occasion. Next year we, are, uh, we shall mark uh, the 70th anniversary of NATO the 15th anniversary of Bulgaria's membership in NATO, and uh, it is not round one, but uh, anyway, uh, it deserves to be mentioned, uh, 28 years of the establishment of the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria. This is uh, uh, something. Uh, you mentioned uh, also uh, that uh, you quoted uh, Richard Holbrook and that 80% uh, and his 80% that diplomats and this applies to politicians as well, 
have to invest in public diplomacy. And uh, I was wondering uh, whether uh, you have uh, such plans uh, in, uh, uh, General Scaparotti has such plans in uh, shape uh, to uh, establish sort of anti-propaganda unit. Uh, this is uh, a new and very serious battle which uh, we have with uh, our opponents or our enemies or whatever you call them. And uh, the 2% is a uh, goal that we support very much, but we would like also to see uh, serious support in the efforts to counter the propaganda and uh, the fake news and the dis uh, disinformation and whatever we call it. This is uh, uh, maybe uh, a question number one that I would like to, to raise. And uh, also uh, another question that uh, we, uh, we have discussed several times uh, uh, at Atlantic Club Forum, Fora is uh, that uh, we, we have uh, Bulgarian-American uh, defense facilities uh, in uh, uh, Novo Selo and Bezmer and uh, partially in Grafignatiev, uh, Grafignatievo, but uh, uh, we believe that it will be very uh, 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 productive for the region, for the peace in the region and for the stability in the region if we have uh, a na naval base at the Bulgarian Black Sea coast. Uh, it could be Bulgarian American, it could be Bulgaria UK, it could be Bulgaria NATO, but uh, we need more and more military presence in order to balance uh, the Russian military presence in the Black Sea. Uh, uh, we, it is, uh, we, do, we believe that it will be absolute, uh, uh, absurd to attack Russian military, but it will be as big absurd not to defend ourselves from Russia as well. And uh, the more we are uh, armed, the uh, better uh, the, the respect uh, to, uh, to, to the neighboring countries will be on behalf of uh, our uh, big neighbors. And uh, also, uh, uh, we, we should not miss the opportunity of having you here to pass uh, through you, as we did uh, through Ambassador uh, Rubin, uh, to invite uh, the new Secretary of, uh, of State, uh, Pompeo to visit us, to speak at the Atlantic Club on one of the anniversaries that uh, we were uh, mentioning, and uh, also to extend an invitation to General Scaparotti to, to do the same on his uh, next visit to Bulgaria. Uh, we have also a number of questions which uh, were, uh, I was informed last night that would be raised from our guests, uh, the junior ambassadors uh, from uh, Pazajik. So, you uh, guys have the floor. Most welcome to raise uh, your questions. Svetilina? Gotovi li ste? Imate li vaprosi? Ajde, stavajte. You will have a microphone. Še imate mikrofon siga, možete i na bulgarski, na engliski, kak to predpočitate. I'm Sarah Kovačeva and it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, and my question is, do you think that society can be explained that security issues in everyday life are tied to the role of NATO at the strategic, strategic level? No, it's a good question because I think sometimes we lose sight of uh, what NATO is about. And fundamentally, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is in so many ways a political organization. It's about collective defense and a strategy of collective defense, uh, a series of, uh, of com commitments that are made through the North Atlantic Treaty uh, to protect each other. An attack on one member of NATO is considered an attack on all. Uh, but it's also a set of, of values. And it's through that framework for almost 70 years that we have uh, been able to maintain uh, a security in Europe. And I think uh, the, the early history of NATO was very uh, successful in uh, allowing uh, Western Europe to prosper, to maintain security, maintain a, a transatlantic link. And then we saw with the end of the Cold War that we were able to expand that and to include natural friends and allies like uh, Bulgaria. So it is very much a strategic organization looking forward and, and expansion of NATO uh, was very much part of, of that strategy. Uh, NATO isn't a threat to anyone. NATO is a defensive organization 
that works on the premise of collective security as the strategy uh, for maintaining stability and then ultimately prosperity in this space. And of course has been looking, as I mentioned, increasingly outward at where the threats to our collective security come from. So the efforts in Afghanistan to uh, bring stability there so that terrorism uh, cannot again take root there. Uh, what NATO is now doing in Iraq in terms of training uh, Iraqi soldiers to take their own security seriously is a very important thing. And the partnerships that NATO has developed uh, with countries in, in North Africa, in the Mediterranean, and as far away as Australia demonstrate that uh, around the world they recognize the success of, of NATO and the model of collective security. And so we see more and more countries representing more and more people wanting to work together on the basis uh, of that model. So thanks for your question. Do you want me, Solomon, to yeah. address? Sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Your first question, I think, was, was very timely, the question of um, uh, information, uh, the challenge that we face uh, in what's known as the, the information space. Uh, and it really has become uh, a major uh, theater uh, for the some of the security challenges we have, part of what is known as, as hybrid challenges or gray zone uh, security challenges. Uh, and we are addressing that at UCOM. Uh, I know allies are trying to address that uh, collectively uh, at NATO and through SHAPE. Uh, and at home, we are uh, increasingly aware and focused uh, on what has evolved and how the information space can be used, can be, can be weaponized. And the first victim in that in that uh, conflict is often the truth. And so I think it is very important to, to go back to uh, remember your history, your context, to understand, as we just discussed with the previous question, what is NATO? What is it about? And not allow some of the, the disinformation, the false narratives, the, the fake news, which is often the, the term used, uh, to infect that space. And I think you guys are a perfect example of the generation that needs to study and understand uh, our history, the 75 years uh, that I talked about since uh, the United States came and engaged to help Europe end uh, the Second World War and the, the tremendous loss and costs and suffering uh, that were experienced through that and to say, Never again are we going to let Europe uh, become the kind of battle space that it was for the years of that war and that we will promote together uh, a set of common values uh, and collective defense. And so there's a, a narrative which is very important to remember in this and to, <coughs> to take, take charge, to take leadership of our own narrative and, and to remember what it is about and I think we all have much more in common in terms of our, our common values, our goals, uh, than we do have uh, dividing us. And the more we can speak honestly and directly and be cognizant of what we're reading uh, and really analyze uh, the sources of our news and information, that's where you start this effort uh, at, at the, the level of the individual citizen. But it certainly has become a part of, of, uh, of defense, uh, thinking about how we capture the, uh, the information uh, space, how we can make sure that the truth uh, can emerge, that people know where they can go for honest news uh, and understand the facts and context of, of what goes on in the world. So that's a big challenge, but it's one we are, we're working on. And again, like everything else, we have to do it collectively because together we're much more, uh, much more powerful than, than individually. 
You mentioned Novoselo, and it's a great opportunity to, uh, to highlight again the, the contributions that Bulgaria makes to the alliance. Uh, the United States invested uh, uh, resources in upgrading Novoselo and making it a, a really top-class um, modern uh, defense installation. Uh, and, and that's the kind of thing we've done with our partners throughout Europe. Uh, because it gives us flexibility. And I think that's perhaps a, a key word in terms of what we look at at, at UCOM and, and ultimately uh, at NATO and SHAPE is um, flexibility. Uh, modern defense, modern warfare and military um, work, I think, has to be ultimately very flexible and, and mobile. It's no longer about big armies uh, or navies taking control of, of space. It's about a, a whole set of things, including uh, the information space, which we mentioned. It's, it's this hybrid threat uh, that we face. And so General Scaparotti has underscored the importance of, of flexibility and mobility. And rotational is very much uh, a key term uh, at UCOM. Forces that are rotational, that train and exercise with partners and allies all over uh, the transatlantic space um, and are mobile, able to respond quickly to changes uh, in the security situation in, in any part of our theater. Uh, and that's really what, what we've been, been focused on. U European command is by its own nature uh, a joint command, so it involves Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, every element of uh, the U.S. Uh, military structure is represented at European Command. And every day we have a review of uh, what each of those components is doing in terms of exercises, uh, what they're seeing in, uh, in their space. Um, and, uh, and I think that gives us a, a very good uh, broad view which we can and share with our, our allies. Um, and address any individual uh, uh, challenges. And I think that's what we're going to continue to see more of in the future is rotational work with, uh, with allies and partners. And in terms of Secretary Pompeo, I'll be happy, along with Ambassador Rubin, to pass the invitation to him. Uh, he himself, in his uh, remarks this week, uh, after his formal swearing in at the State Department by, by President Trump, uh, talked about how much he wants to travel, how many places there are to go, how many missions, diplomatic missions we have uh, around the world. So there's a lot for him to do. I will point out that our assistant secretary, I mentioned uh, Wes Mitchell, the assistant secretary for Europe, uh, just recently had a, a phone call. I read about it first in the, in the Bulgarian media, uh, but he was able to call up and talk to your prime minister. Uh, and, and that is also so important. I know Wes fairly well, and uh, he values that because uh, we can have great diplomacy and interaction, but a 15-minute phone call to trade ideas, to, to update, is also a key part of, of what we do. And, uh, and the modern technology allows us to do that uh, uh, any, from anywhere in the world. I had a, a secure video conference with Wes Mitchell. He was in Tbilisi earlier th uh, uh, this week. I was in, uh, in Stuttgart, and uh, we were able to have a great conversation right like that. So the, the technology, which is, is something you guys are all used to, to me is still uh, a marvel. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, when I was in, in uh, Kosovo, uh, we didn't have <laughs> that kind of technology. And so the, the world moves on very quickly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm glad to be here. Um, my, my name is uh, Nikolai Andrew from uh, Pazarjik High School, Ivan Aksakov, and I'm a junior am ambassador. <coughs> my question is um, for Mr. Philip Recker. Uh, what is the position of NATO and the uh, forthcoming peace process on the Korean Peninsula? 
Well, thanks, thanks for the question. And if I may enlarge the question. Yeah, please, uh, Solomon. Uh, you mentioned uh, also the strategic partnerships uh, of NATO. And uh, we had in NATO an old idea to establish uh, uh, much closer cooperation with Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand uh, as our partners. How far did uh, uh, this idea go? And in the context of uh, North-South Korea talks, I would like, uh, I'll be very happy to see uh, the next uh, Nobel Peace Prize to go to those who will secure the peace in this uh, region and to host uh, them in Bulgaria, uh, uh, Ambassador Rubin. <laughs> You've got big plans, Solomon. I think that's great. Well, thanks for, for bringing up that question because I think it illustrates again how uh, everything we deal with in, in the transatlantic theater has a global uh, aspect to it as well. Uh, we're constantly aware at European Command as we work with the other geographic combatant ca commands of the U.S. military uh, Central Command, which has uh, the Middle East um, and, uh, and extends uh, as far as, uh, how far does Central Command go? Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Pacific Command, which has a vast part of the world. Um, but in fact, if you realize uh, Pacific Command and European Command actually have a border because uh, Europe includes Russia, which has an enormous Pacific presence. And of course we know when it comes to uh, discussions on the Korean Peninsula, Russia as well as China and Japan and of course South Korea uh, have been very much a part of efforts to, uh, to work with North Korea. I think we've seen some remarkable uh, developments there just in the past couple of weeks and of course the news uh, that President Trump plans to uh, sit down with the uh, North Korean president uh, at a summit soon is also something that many of us uh, perhaps would never have, have imagined uh, we would see. Uh, so we have to always be prepared for these changes and developments and while European Command uh, and in that sense also NATO has no direct uh, relationship uh, to the, the issues um, on the Korean Peninsula, we keep track of these things because it's all interconnected. Uh, if there is a security challenge in the Pacific, including potentially in the Korean Peninsula, uh, then European Command may have to uh, provide resources and equipment to Pacific Command if we need to beef up uh, our presence in any particular part of the world. And so we're always working together uh, truly in a global capacity. Um, NATO is, is much more focused, of course, uh, on its member states, its, its area uh, of operations, but um, uh, it also has these partnerships that we mentioned. And I pulled this out uh, just because I, I carry it with me. It's too, too small to see, but it's a sort of uh, overlapping diagram of European security structures and it mentions NATO partners across the globe and NATO has formal partnership agreements um, with Mongolia, with South Korea, with Japan, with Australia and New Zealand, with Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now people would say, you know, that's, but that's not the North Atlantic. Well, it's obviously not, but in the 21st century, there is a global component to this. And so as we said, if we're trying to deal with threats that come from, let's say, uh, terrorist groups training uh, and operating in Afghanistan, that has a global uh, impact. And so we found that more and more countries, I mean, that they're lined up, are interested in partnering with NATO in, in different capacities. It doesn't mean they want to become members of NATO, nor would that be appropriate. Um, but we have partnerships, NATO has dialogues, there's a Mediterranean dialogue where NATO is working very closely with Algeria and uh, Egypt, and Jordan and Mauritania, uh, Tunisia, Morocco and Israel. Uh, there's the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative under the NATO umbrella 
with uh, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates. And so it really illustrates how global, in a sense, uh, these structures can be. It's all about cooperative effort. Uh, it's all about communication, uh, understanding each other, uh, sharing strategic ideas for the common goal of maintaining peace and stability, uh, which of course is the key to, uh, to prosperity as well. So. Thanks, and congratulations on your English. You guys are... Thank you. I'm, I'm so and, uh, impressed. Speaking of, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Mongolia, and uh, I'm tempted to remind uh, that there is a Bulgarian finger in this partnership. In 2004, Bulgaria was chairing uh, OSC. Right. And uh, it was uh, our Bulgarian idea to invite Mongolia as newest partner, uh, newest Asian partner in OSC. And in the beginning, when we raised the question, everybody uh, in OSC, 55 countries, they uh, asked us, are you crazy? Uh, uh, what, what uh, there is to do, uh, what has Mongolia to do with, uh, with Europe? Uh, we did not have uh, arguments who, who would be understandable to everybody, so we used one uh, understandable but not very uh, valid argument, but very understandable. We told them, the Mongolians are using the Cyrillic alphabet. So, uh, so th this Something was, in common, at everybody. the end of the day, during the ministerial of OSC in Sofia, Mongolia was uh, invited as newest member of OSC, and this was a formal ground for Mongolia to, to apply for a uh, partnership with, with NATO, because uh, according to NATO's uh, regulations, you have to be in one way or another in OSC in order to apply. So we are very proud to uh, hear about the developments uh, in uh, Mongolia, and uh, I, I will give now the floor to uh, Ambassador Pop Tudorova who wants to say something and return back the word to uh, our uh, uh, junior ambassadors. But before that, искам да кажа нещо на български, за да съм пределно ясен. Тъй като вчера една парламентарна партия каза, че ще прави референдум за излизане от НАТО. Искам специално да ви кажа, особено на нашите млади посланници, че това е невъзможно. Това е невъзможно, защото според българската конституция, която и аз съм подписал и госпожа Поп Тодорова като депутати сме подписали през 1991 година, в тая конституция много ясно е записан един член, че референдуми по влизане и излизане в международни договори могат да се правят само преди ратификацията на този договор. Тоест, ние не можем да правим никакъв референдум от тук нататък по българската конституция за излизане от НАТО, за излизане от Европейския съюз, за излизане от ООН, за излизане от ОСС, за излизане от ЮНЕСКО, за излизане от където и да било. Това е фета компли, завършена работа и дайте да не мислим за глупости, да вървим напред. Така. Да, благодаря. След като монголците използват кирилицата, мен ме е срам да задавам въпроса на английски, ще го задам на български. Още повече, че и послани Крикър, и послани Крубин разбират добре този език. А и по още една причина искам да върна разговора по-близо до дома. Основен въпрос за Европа е интеграцията на Западните Балкани. Това е и основна тема на българското председателство. Разбира се, няма да обсъждаме опциите за Европейски съюз сега. Те са сложни, далечни, неясни. Моето, ще кажа, и разбиране, и надежда е диалога по сигурността, трансатлантическия диалог да се придвижи по-бързо, така както беше опитът на България, Румъния и практически на всички държави, от новото попълнение в пакта. А същевременно имаме една сложна обстановка по Слани Крикър. Независимо от много конструктивното поведение на Македония, се създава постоянен блокаж към единственото голямо препятствие за решаване на въпроса с името. Моите подозрения са, че 
Това не е случайно и не е единствено двустранен този проблем. Той е силно подпомаган и от външни фактори, които не са заинтересовани трансатлантическият терен да обхване и Македония. Същевременно възникнаха напреженията между Косово и Сърбия, което добавя към коктейла от много не благоприятни обстоятелства именно в Западните Балкани днес. Какъв е вашият прочит, вашият анализ като отличен познавач на региона, като човек наистина, който е бил на терен в Косово и същевременно от перспективата на въпросите за сигурността на региона, защото трансатлантическата сигурност няма да е пълна, докато максимален брой държави от региона не бъдат приобщени, не бъдат интегрирани. Благодаря ви. И тъй като от екипа на посланник Рикър ми казаха, че той има още 4 минути, а всички ученици, които имате въпроси, кажете по въпрос за по 30 секунди. Hello, I'm Sashko Penef, it's a pleasure to meet you. And my question is, is not the planning to establish a council on cooperation with China, similar to the one with Russia? Thank you. Cooperation with China and maybe NATO, NATO troops to replace the American troops in South Korea. Uh, another question, Drug Vapros, uh, do you have any Hello, my name is Trifon Avramov and for me it's an honor to be here. My question is, what will be the next enlargement of NATO and uh, which countries will it include? Мерси. Филип подписа с моята писалка, преподписа европейския договор с писалката, с която аз съм го подписвал едно време. Друг въпрос има ли? Аз се казвам Петя Дамянова и съм младши посланник на Европейския парламент. Фактът, че някои от страните членки използват съветко с въоръжение и техника, прави ли ги по-уязвими и евентуални злонамерени кибератаки или други тип диверсия от Русия, опознаваща в детайли въоръжението и техниката и ангажирана с ремонти на подръжката им? Сайбератак с Русия. Друг въпрос имаш ли? Бързо. Аз имам микрофон. Здравейте, казвам се Мария Христоскова, младши посланник на Европейския парламент от гимназия Аксаков. Необходимо ли е на страните членки на НАТО да разработва способности за защита на нападение от отровно химическо вещество след натребването на граждани на член на НАТО и наличието на отровни вещества в страни като Сирия и Либия? И Лондон. Благодаря. Директорката. Директорката има въпрос. Това е служител. Изключителна чест е за всички нас да сме тук. Учениците ми вече го изразиха. Иванка Ваклинова, директор на гимназия Ксаков град Пазържик. След въпросите на моите ученици, бихте ли подкрепили една инициатива за образование за мир в училище и инвестицията в образование ще носи след това спестяване на средства за отбрана. Благодаря. Амбасадър, ти имаш въпроси за три други лекции, така че ти трябва да решиш как да отговориш. Благодаря ти за всички въпроси. Това са всички въпроси. Не може да се трябва да 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 трябва Uh, in your remarks, and it's, it's so gratifying to see our students, our junior ambassadors, thinking about these issues, studying these issues, uh, reading, uh, I hope, the history and context of these issues, and uh, really giving some thought to it, um, because that's what's important. Your generation is, is next. Uh, you know, my grandfather uh, fought in the Second World War to liberate Europe and move forward. That's ongoing process has taken taken a long time and worked in, in stages um, different generations have come in and, and yours is going to be next and you're going to have to uh, deal with things like cyber cyber terrorism uh, cyber weaponry uh, this is a major issue now we have a cyber command uh, in the United States as part of our military structure that looks at this it's a component of, uh, of strategy um, we've seen 
uh, cyber crime, but we've seen uh, nations, countries, governments use uh, cyber as an effective weapon. And I think it's something we all have to uh, be aware of. Uh, and I think we've been trying to call out countries uh, who have done this. We've seen in our country um, you know, meddling in our elections through cyber means, uh, the whole issue that we talked about earlier of, uh, of disinformation uh, has a cyber component to it, but more specifically the ability to affect uh, systems, infrastructure, uh, by cyber means is a challenge. Of course, that's added to the other challenges uh, of, that have been around for a long time, chemical and bio uh, weapons, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, these are still challenges uh, that, that we have to be aware of and what Russia did uh, recently in the poisoning uh, case, what Syria did in terms of using uh, uh, chlorine uh, and chemical weapons against its own people uh, illustrates to us that this is still a problem. I mean, it's a hundred years since the First World War when uh, mustard gas and other chemicals were, were used on the battlefield and the horrors of, of that uh, were supposed to be enough to, to convince us all to ban those weapons. And of course what we've seen is despite a set of uh, infra infrastructure institutions um, like the Committee to Prevent Chemical Weapons, which is based in, in The Hague, um, we still have these problems. So those are challenges. Again, your generation will have to continue uh, to look at that um, and keep it in mind. On Western Balkans, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, if you think about where the Western Balkans were 20 years ago, we've come a long way. Uh, you have to remember the origin of this in many ways goes way back. Uh, one solution to the Western Balkans challenges that were very evident in the 18th and 19th century uh, for European strategic thinkers uh, was Yugoslavia. And that maintained a, a peace, a stability, and frankly, a, a level of um, prosperity in Yugoslavia that was the envy of other countries in the region at the time. Unfortunately, uh, forces of nationalism and populism, criminal elements, those who were not dedicated to the rule of law as the guiding principle uh, of, of a country, of a, of a civilization, uh, saw Yugoslavia fall apart. And I often will remind people in the Balkans that if Yugoslavia had been able to hold itself together, been able to discuss its challenges, been able to use its diversity, its inter-ethnic mix as a strength, rather than allow it to pull the country apart, Yugoslavia could have entered the European Union, uh, probably ahead of any of the other new members, and would have an economy uh, like that of Poland right now. And so I think people need to keep that in mind uh, when they allow themselves to be drawn down this road of, of populism and, and nationalism that has uh, been so, so much a problem in the Western Balkans. But I'm optimistic because we see real progress. Macedonia has made real progress and, and uh, I think some of that is due to strong support and friendship from Bulgaria. And it's a natural thing. <coughs> uh, so I'm very happy to see that. I do think uh, there's a great opportunity now between Macedonia and Greece to resolve their issue. I think the diplomats from both countries are working very hard on that. The United States has always uh, supported the two countries working on that with the, with the help of uh, the United Nations, uh, Matt Nimitz, the special rapporteur for that, uh, the, the name issue. And I think they have a real opportunity uh, to resolve it. These things are not easy questions, but they take long-term engagement. It's been a decade exactly this year since um, we expected Macedonia to uh, receive a NATO membership invitation at the same time as Albania and Croatia. And of course, due to the, the challenge, that, that didn't happen. So with uh, continued hard work, I think they can, they can uh, find a resolution to that. And, and NATO's made very clear uh, that over 10 years repeatedly, that when that issue is resolved, Macedonia will be ready to uh, receive their uh, invitation. And that will just increase 
the stability of this region. It'll mean, you know, another one of Bulgaria's neighbors is, is an ally under the North Atlantic Treaty, uh, and, and that's a, a positive thing. The final two, two points tied to your questions, um, someone brought up China. China is a, is, a, is a huge issue, it's a huge country with an enormous economy. Uh, China has challenges as well, um, and, uh, and we have a lot of areas where we, we disagree uh, with China. But I think, again, diplomacy is critical to communicating, to discussing our differences, to looking at ways uh, to resolve them, to better understand uh, each other. Uh, so I know there are a lot of, uh, of students your age in, in our country who have been studying Chinese. It became very popular to study Chinese because they realized there are you know, 1.4 billion Chinese out there. Uh, and, and that's heartening because just as you've learned English so well, and that's such a key to your future because it's, it's the way that much of the world communicates through English. Um, seeing young Americans learning Chinese, Chinese learning English, means there's opportunity for the kind of communication that we need in the future. And that all ties in, of course, to investment in education. Uh, and I think what you're what your teacher and leader has, has said is, is so very true. We need to make sure we invest uh, in education for this next generation. We have to be thinking ahead. Uh, and in the United States, just in recent weeks, we're seeing uh, a number of states where teachers have been standing up and actually going on strike and saying, hey, we need you to invest more in teachers so that they can have uh, salaries that, that allow them to uh, to live comfortable lives uh, and invest in, in the infrastructure of education, which is the key to any country's uh, future. So with that, I just want to thank again our junior ambassadors. I look forward to uh, seeing you at Diplomatic Fora in coming years. Make sure you say hello when I'm old and uh, I've already lost my hair, but uh, we'll do that got great futures ahead of you, and, and Bulgaria has a great future ahead of you, and, and the United States, I know, is very proud of our partnership uh, with Bulgaria as an ally, as a friend. Uh, we have a lot of things uh, we, we work on together in so, so many spheres, uh, and this kind of forum to have discussions like this uh, is a really positive aspect of that. So I want to thank the embassy and my colleagues for uh, inviting me, and, and Solomon for inviting me to address the Atlantic Club of Bulgaria, and wish you all uh, a very good uh, end to the Bulgarian presidency, the presidency of the European Union. You've done a, a terrific job. Uh, and just to congratulate you on the, the tremendous progress that you've made and the, the future we share ahead. Thanks. Most welcome next time again. Okay. Ha, ha, ha.